Hello and welcome to a new Backdive tutorial. In this video, I want to introduce you to the Backdive API. I'm going to start with a few words on APIs in general before showing you how you can access the Backdive API. I will also explain all the different Backdive API endpoints and show you how you can easily test them in your browser. API stands for Application Programming Interface. And APIs basically are sets of procedures that allow two applications to communicate with each other. What that means for us is that we can use these procedures to write code that communicates with another application like a software or a website like Backdive. And we can then automatically make requests for information to that website. This is the URL for the Backdive API. You can reach the API by simply typing this URL into the address bar of your browser window or by clicking the Web Services tab on the Backdive website. The starting page for the Backdive API gives you a short description and documentation, but before you can actually use any of the procedures, you first have to log in or register. Registration is really easy though. You simply have to fill out this short form and when you send it off, you will almost immediately receive an email asking you to confirm your email address. And once you have done this, you are ready to use the Backdive API. The Backdive API has five different endpoints or network locations that can be used to send requests and receive data. The most important one is called Fetch. You can make requests to this endpoint using Backdive IDs and receive detailed information on the strains that are behind these IDs. To test out the endpoints, you can simply write the URLs into the address bar of your browser window. Behind the basic URL of the Backdive API, you simply add the name of the endpoint, here, fetch, and then the ID you want to search with. I'm using this one. Using this endpoint, you can actually look up up to 100 Backdive IDs at the same time. I'm just going to add a second one for this example. They have to be separated by a semicolon. And when I now press Enter, I receive back my results in JSON format. This is what a JSON file usually looks like. As you can see, it's not really very nice to read. The Firefox browser, which I'm using here, gives us the option to view this in a more human-readable format, which I think is quite nice to have a look and get an overview over the kind of data we receive back and how they are structured. This JSON file has four main fields. The first one is count, and this simply gives us the number of entries we received. As you remember, I requested information on two different strains, and now we received two entries. The next and previous fields are empty in this case. These are important when we receive back information on a large number of strains. Then we have a pagination with a maximum of 100 strains on one page. And in these fields, we can then find the links to the next or the previous page. The actual results or data we received back is in the results field. When I uncollapse this, I can see here the two strains that I requested. When I uncollapse this further, I can see here the headers of the information I received. Under the general header, for example, I have things like the DSM number, some keywords on the strain or the strain history. Under name and taxonomic classification, I have things like domain, phylum, class, the full scientific name or the information if this is a type strain. Next are morphology, culture and growth conditions and basically all the information that you can also see when you search for a strain on the Backdive website. The same of course I also have for the second strain. We have four more endpoints and to these we can make requests using other identifiers like culture collection numbers, taxon names, or sequence accession numbers. I am now going to show an example using a culture collection number. Again, we have to specify the endpoint after the basic URL for the API. In this case, the endpoint is called culture collection number. 
And after this, we add obviously a culture collection number. When I now press enter, we again receive back a JSON file. But in this case, the results only contain one piece of information, and that is the backdive ID of the strain for which I gave the culture collection number. Of course, we could now again use the fetch endpoint to find out more about this strain. If you want to know all backdive IDs of strains in the backdive database for a certain taxon, you can use the taxon endpoint. You simply have to specify the endpoint taxon and then you can add a genus, species or subspecies name. I'm going to start with a genus, in my case Myroides, and the JSON file I now receive back gives me a count of 106, so there are 106 strains for this genus in the backdive database. And in this case you can now also see what it looks like when there is a pagination and the next field is filled, here in the next field, we now have the link to the second page of our results. On this page, I have the results for the first 100 strains, and to get to the final 6, I have to click on this link in the next field. If I want to search for a species name, I add another slash after the genus name, and then the species epithet after that. The species I'm going to search for is called Myroides odoratus. And as you can see, there are 19 strains for this species in the backdive database. And for all of them, I here have the backdive IDs. If you want to search with a subspecies name, this works the same. You simply add another slash and then the subspecies epithet. The two remaining endpoints work with sequence accession numbers. The sequence 16S endpoint can be used to look up backdev IDs of strains by making requests using the sequence accession numbers of the 16S rRNA nucleotide sequences. For example, this one. Again, I receive a JSON file with simply the backdev ID in the results field. The sequence genome endpoint works with GenBank assembly accessions and whole genome sequencing project numbers. And this already brings me to the end of this short introduction. You now know all the endpoints of the Backdive API and you have seen the results that you will receive back when you make requests to these endpoints. If you have never coded before, you might now wonder how any of this is actually any easier than simply looking up the information on the strains on the Backdive website. But as I said in the beginning, we can now use these procedures to write code that automatically makes these requests and looks up this information. And for an easier integration of Backdive API requests into your code, we actually offer two packages in both R and Python. And if you want to see how these work, you can watch our next two video tutorials. See you then. Bye.